Well, good morning and welcome to our virtual life group lesson for April 2nd, Palm Sunday, by the way. And today we are talking about the fact that Jesus died for me. And if you grew up in church, if you've been in church for a long time, that's one of those things that you are certainly aware of. <clears throat> Perhaps something that we have a tendency to take for granted. We can say it, it can just roll off of our tongue so easily. And yet sometimes we don't actually stop to really digest it or chew on it or think about what does that really actually mean? And so I wanted to begin with a simple question. What is the nicest thing anybody has ever done for you? What is the most unselfish thing that someone has ever done specifically for you? Well, I could think of lots and lots of things that people have done for me over the years, very kind and unselfish acts that people have done for me. And usually there's one thing that sticks out, one person or one thing that really, really stands out in your memory. So why do you remember that? What is it that mattered so much to you? What made that such a special thing? Um, I'm reminded of Jesus' words when he expressed uh, in the Last Supper to his disciples that the, that the next time that they took the Lord's Supper, that they took communion together, he said to do this in remembrance of me. He wanted them to remember what he was doing for them. And it wasn't just about serving them. It wasn't just about washing their feet. It wasn't just about having a meal together and taking communion together. It was that this represented the body and the blood shed for their sins, that he was dying for them. And that's what he wanted them to truly remember, to be thinking about. And so he said, do this in remembrance of me. We're going to be taking communion tonight in our Palm Sunday service at 6 p.m., and we're going to remember what Jesus did for us. And that's that's the whole point of taking communion. The Lord's Supper is remembering this one magnificent thing that was done for me. Jesus died for me. So I want us to look at John chapter 19 together. And we're going to look at three different sets of verses from John chapter 19. And the first set is verses 16 through 19. And it says, finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And so the very first event of the cross, this first event of, of this magnificent sacrifice is that he is literally bearing it himself. Um, we know from the story, we know from the scripture how this came to be, and we understand that it was Judas who ultimately betrayed him. Now, many others, obviously, but within his inner circle, it was Judas who ultimately betrayed him. It was Pilate who ultimately sentenced him. It was the soldiers who ultimately arrested him. But it was Jesus himself who actually took up the cross. That's important. That is a very significant and profound thing to keep in mind. He was not forced to take up the cross. He was not forced to go to death. He was not forced to be executed. He willingly went. And the Bible tells us this over and over and over again. This was his decision. This was his choice. Now, there were all the uh, ancillary things that had to happen to take place to uh, to create the legal circumstances under which an execution could happen. But Jesus Christ was fully in charge of the whole thing, and he fully allowed every bit of this to happen. And so, no, he did not betray himself, and no, he did not sentence himself to die, and no, he did not arrest himself, and yet he took up the cross. He did that. He bore that cross. 
And the great irony is that in killing Christ, they actually secured their own salvation. That is mind-blowing. And it even sounds wrong to say it, that in killing Jesus, they actually secured their own salvation, but you can't deny it. You cannot deny that the salvation that came from the death of Jesus Christ, ironically, was instituted and brought about by these people who were unrepentant rejectors of Christ. And yet, once they had killed him, and once the blood had been shed, salvation was available for them. Perhaps that helps you understand why when he was on the cross, he literally said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And so he was expressing that very ironic situation where they don't understand that they, by killing me, have actually opened up the path of forgiveness. Now that takes a uh, that takes a mind that is far more creative than me, far more brilliant than me, and far more loving than me. Because if I was God, I wouldn't have done it that way. But God is God, and he's beautiful, and he's perfect, and he's amazing, and his love for us is, is, is beyond what we can even imagine. And so here you have this beautiful irony that in denying Jesus Christ, in denying the salvation of Christ, in denying the messiahship of Christ, they inadvertently opened up the whole world to salvation. And I am here a product of that. Does that mean I'm thankful that these men committed a horrid act? No, 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 no. Not saying that at all. They committed horrid acts. And if they never accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, they paid dearly for it, okay? But you had that one centurion at the cross who, after the situation, said, truly, this was the Son of God. So you had at least one conversion that we are aware of. Somebody who was very involved in killing his own Messiah. But there's a reality. I am a sinner as well. No, I was not there 2,000 years ago. No, I did not hurl insults at him. No, I did not spit on him. No, I did not beat on him. No, I did not drive the nails. But my sin did. And I have to remember that. When I go back and I look at this story, I cannot say, look at those horrid, awful, wretched people and what they did to Christ because my sin did that to Christ. Sin is the great equalizer. We are all sinners, and the scripture says that we all have sinned, and we all fall short of the glory of God. All. Not some. Not just the people who nailed him to the cross. All. That's very humbling. So then you find here that in verse 18, that they crucified him, and with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. So you have two criminals. And within this picture, I mean, this is this is amazing to me when you stop and think about it. You have this image of Christ on the cross, and on one side you have a criminal, on the other side you have a criminal. And what do we know from uh, the other gospel accounts, and you put all of it together, what do we know about them? Well, they were both legally guilty. They both deserved the punishment that they were receiving. They were both spiritually guilty. They were both lost. And yet, the only difference between the two is their reaction, because we do discover that one of them was hurling insults at Jesus and mocking him, and the other professed his faith in Jesus, believed that he was going to somehow usher in a spiritual kingdom and asked to be remembered. And Jesus said, this day you will be with me in paradise. He said, you're saved. Interesting, but what you see in this is a little microcosm of 
all humanity, you have a choice. Jesus is in the middle and you have a decision to make. You're going to be on one side of Christ or the other forever. Forever. You're going to be on one side. You're either going to be on the side of mocking or you're going to be on the side of belief. And I think that's why Jesus was crucified, not alone. I mean, you would think that if God Almighty comes to earth and God Almighty comes as a lamb to be slain for the sins of the world, that he would be the center point, that there would be nobody else crucified with him. He would be the only one there at the on the cross and there'd be nobody else for anybody to pay attention to. And yet you have this picture of the three crosses. One in the middle is the savior of the world. One on one side, I don't want that. The other said, that's exactly what I want. That, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing that God did. Putting a physical, a physical picture for the world to look at. This is your future right here. This is your future. You make one decision or the other, and it will affect you forever. <clears throat> so there is also in this scripture the notice, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And there's some interesting things about that as well. This is sort of a tacit acknowledgement of Christ's political title. Um, he was legitimately heir to the throne because we know we have two genealogies that we really depend on. Matthew gives us a genealogy that basically goes from Abraham to Joseph. So Matthew is mostly concerned with showing how Jesus is a legitimate heir to Abraham, that this is all about Jewish genealogy, okay? Abraham being the first of the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, chosen by God to be the father of them. And so Matthew wants to cover the fact that spiritually, Jesus is an heir to Abraham and that lineage. He's part of that seed. But legally, he also is focusing on the fact that as Joseph is his legal father, even though he's not his genetic father, he is his legal father. And so because from Abraham you had the royal line of David, and now you have a descendant of David who is Jesus of Nazareth, even though he's a humble carpenter, he has royal blood within him. And so Matthew is showing us in his genealogy that Jesus Christ is very much, absolutely, an heir to the throne of David. He has a legitimate uh, claim to the title. And even though they're mocking Christ, they're telling the truth because he is the king of the Jews. He is the king of Israel, legitimately. But when you look at Luke's genealogy, he goes backwards in his genealogy, and he carries us all the way from Mary back to Adam. And so Luke's genealogy is designed to help us understand that Jesus Christ is that second Adam. That Adam failed, Christ did not. And so you have these beautiful things, but all of it's sort of wrapped up in this, this one little notice that they nailed to the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Like I said, it was it was put there as mockery, but it was actually true. So Jesus was a legitimate legal heir to the throne. He was also a direct descendant of Adam, and I know we all are. But um, you see the reality that he is doing what Adam could not do. We cannot fulfill the law. We fall short of the glory of God, but Jesus Christ did not. He expose the glory of God. So now let's look at verses 28 through 30. This is our second set of verses, 28 through 30. Join with me if you would. We're still in chapter 19. It says, later knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
So here you have, in this section, now you have some interesting things to think about. Okay, so first of all, Jesus, at this point, he's hanging on the cross. He's been beaten to within a pulp of his life. He's lost a lot of blood. Um, he's dying, okay? It's a slow and agonizing death, but he's dying. And yet he still has complete control over his will and his emotions. This is, a, to me, um, a testimony to the strength, not only the strength, the physical strength, but the character strength of Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm talking about the human side of him. He's fully God, but he's also human. He has put himself within the limitations of a human body. And you and I all know, especially those of us who are getting a little bit older, we know what limitations we have within our human body. And yet there is this incredible fortitude, this incredible mental, spiritual, and physical strength. And even as he is dying, he wants to make sure that he is in complete control of his faculties. He's not going to just pass out on the cross and then slip away into death. He's going to surrender himself. He's going to give up his spirit, his soul, surrender himself to death. And so he is completely on track. And he's also determined to act exactly as the scripture required. He's proving that he is the absolute fulfillment of scripture. Why does that matter? Because he's been trying to explain to people that he is the fulfillment of all the prophetic words of scripture that talk about God coming down as man, Messiah, to come and bring salvation to the world. And that's what John the Baptist testified. There he is, the Lamb who comes to save the world. And he's making sure that he fulfills the promise. I mean, even as he's dying on the cross, he's making sure that he dots every I and crosses every T, that he does everything exactly as he's supposed to. If you've been listening to my teaching and preaching for any time, you know that I, I keep saying this. Jesus understood the timeline. He understood the schedule. He knew exactly what had to be done, when it had to be done, and he never varied from the schedule. It was very orderly. It was very well planned, and it was perfectly executed. So even to the point of getting nailed to the cross, it was at schedule. And it was at Passover because he fulfilled the literal Jewish feasts. And we've studied that before, but it bears repeating. When you go and you look at the feasts that God had instituted for the Jewish people, each one of them represented an act of Christ. And Passover was a forebearer, a forerunner, a prophet. Um, understanding of this very moment, Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundations of the earth, dying at Passover for the sins of his people. Perfect. Now, there's a third point here. Jesus wanted to be very clear and very focused on the very moment that he surrendered his life. Like I said, um, he was not going to just slip into a coma or just become unconscious and then people go, oh, well, he's dead. No, he actually declared it. He said, it is finished. I'm done. Now I can die. Very, very precise. Um, all of this is Christ's way of proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was the promised anointed one of God, the son of God. He's it. And when he said it is finished, he's summing up not just his death, his entire ministry, his entire mission coming to earth. Emmanuel literally means God with us. God came down to earth, took on human form, lived among us for 33 years, died for us. And when he had finished everything, everything, all the miracles, all the healing, all the teaching, all the preaching, setting aside the disciples, preparing them to be the, the launchers of the church, everything that he had done. He's like, okay, it's finished now. 
and I can die. <laughs> so precise, so perfectly planned, so perfectly executed. So he willingly carried the cross. Nobody forced him to. And he willingly gave up his spirit. He willingly died. Now, there is a third set of scripture that we're going to look at, verses 38 through 42. And here we're shifting our focus from Christ to a couple of his followers. So, verse 38 says, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. That means he feared the religious Jews, the religious leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So, what do we learn from this? Well, we have this picture of two men. Okay, so we had this first picture of two men on the crosses on either side of Christ Jesus, and that was a representation of humanity. Everybody gets to make a decision about Christ. You're either going to mock him, reject him, or you're going to accept him. And now you have a different picture of a different two men who are both believers. So we've turned our attention from this is the choice of all humanity. Now this is a look, a picture at believers. Okay, this, this speaks more directly to you and I. And interestingly enough, of the two men, you had Joseph of Arimathea, of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple. He was afraid to publicly announce his faith in Jesus Christ because there's such a great punishment and persecution attached to that. And then you had Nicodemus, and as, the men, as uh, it alluded to here, um, he's somebody who had come and, and spoken and expressed faith in Jesus Christ, but had had been somewhat secretive and um, discreet about it, okay? And in John, we're understanding the biggest reason is because he was afraid, okay? And yet, what happens? I mean, sometimes we read this particular passage and we see them as still being secret disciples and still being a little bit timid, and yet, what are they doing in this passage? Okay, first of all, they're not being secretive anymore, and they're not being timid anymore, okay? They are now moving into a moment of boldness. What changed? Well, the Savior of the world, the one that they had expressed their faith in, put their faith in, the one that they were following— He's been executed. Oddly enough, these two men do not wait for the resurrection to be truly believers. They're not, they're not resurrection believers like, oh, after he shows himself, oh, now I believe, because a lot of people believed after the resurrection. No, these, these are men are like after the death. You know what? I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. He was who he was, said he was, and not only that, I'm done being timid and I'm done being secret, okay? Because stop and think about it. What did Joseph do? What did the secret disciple do? Well, he approached the governor. He went to the head of the government and said, I want the body of this man that you just executed. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm adding. I'm just, I'm speculating about what that conversation might have sounded like, but it could have sounded like, yeah, Jesus of Nazareth, the one that you're persecuting everybody for, uh, people who follow him are being thrown in jail, stoned, put to death, so on and so forth. Yeah, I want his body. I want to go take care of him. I'm going to give him a proper burial. Do you understand how unsecretive that was? Do you understand how non-timid that was? 
And we often talk about the change in the disciples after the resurrection. But here you have a massive change in these two men, not after the resurrection, not after the glorious miracle of resurrection, but after the gory death of Jesus. They are bold, bold enough to go to the government and say, I want the body of that man. I want to give him a proper burial. And so he publicly went and claimed the body and took the body. People saw this. The public was aware. The public was there. They saw it. Oh, that's Joseph Affair. What, what, what's he doing? He's, he's taking the body of Jesus. He must be a believer. Well, it's not a secret anymore because nobody but a true believer in Jesus would be taking that body. Nobody else would want to be associated with that. And then he recruits a helper who is timid by nature, but is now willing to not be timid anymore. Um, they brought 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. I don't know enough about ancient history to know if the average person kept 75 pounds of burial spices and products in their home or not. But I'm going to venture a guess that he probably had to go purchase these things. That would be more logical that you had to go and procure these things. I wouldn't think that the average person would simply have this laying around in their kitchen. Now, I could be wrong about that, and I'm welcome for anybody to explain to me if you know history better than I do. Many of you do. I'm simply saying, I think that people would have been aware when you're preparing for a funeral. I know that these days, when you're preparing for a funeral, it's not private in most cases, not just the funeral homes, but your churches. People are aware. They know, oh, they're meeting with the uh, funeral directors today. They're preparing things today. Everything is generally somewhat public. And I don't see that being any different here. So there's no more timidity with Nicodemus. And there is no more secrecy with Joseph. And so then they go and they get the body and they wrap it in linen and they prepare it with all of the spices and all of the things that are done. And I want you to stop and think about that for just a moment. We have an ick factor when we think about dealing with dead people, okay? When we see deceased persons, generally we see them in the funeral home, in the casket, beautifully dressed, makeup on them. Yes, they put makeup even on the men to make them look as natural and alive as possible. Their hair looks good. I mean, you can visit somebody in the hospital or on their deathbed and they look terrible sometimes. And then when you get to see them a few days later, they've passed and they're with Jesus, praise the Lord. But the body in the casket, sometimes we're shocked. We say, oh my goodness, she looks so good. And we don't mean to seem weird with that. What we're just saying is she doesn't even look like she was sick. That's how we perceive dead people. It's shocking to us if we see images on the news of dead people who have not been prepared, okay? So I just want you to stop and think about the awkwardness of handling not only a dead body, but handling a dead body that's been mutilated, that has holes in it, that has bled out, that is lashed, covered with dried blood and mud and dirt from being dragged around in the streets, and other people's spit and saliva and sweat and this vinegar drink that they had given him that may have dripped on I mean, he would have stunk. He would have looked 
horrific. He would have probably been unrecognizable and bloody and messy and gory and dirty. And most of us wouldn't be able to get within 20 feet of that. The smell alone would turn us away. The sight would probably make us vomit. But these two men very lovingly wrapped this body in linen and prepared it with all the proper spices and all the things that they did ritually and they did it out of great love and tenderness and affection. Don't, don't read over that and fail to think about it. Don't just read, oh, they took his body and they wrapped it in linen and they put it in the tomb. That's so easy to say. Stop and put yourself in that moment and think about what that actually looked like. So what makes someone so bold for Christ, especially someone who had been quite secretive, who had been timid, two men who had been secretive and timid. What made them so bold? It was seeing the sacrifice right in front of their eyes. I think sometimes we take the sacrifice for granted because we didn't visibly witness it. We didn't see it. When Jesus tells us to take communion and he says, take this and this is like my blood and take this and this represents my body, he's wanting us to stop and put ourselves in that moment and think about what that actually means. What a beautiful, beautiful portrait of sacrifice. And I just cannot stop emphasizing it's not the glory of the resurrection that has transformed these men. It's not the miracle of him rising out of the tomb that has made them bold. It's seeing the sacrifice that changed them. Let's pray about that. Our Father, we thank you for you are a great and awesome God. We thank you for the sacrifice of our Jesus. And we pray, Father, that you would cover us and bless us. Lord, help us. Help us to be reminded of this beautiful sacrifice, even though we didn't visibly see it, Lord. Help us to see it in our hearts and to recognize it for what it is. We ask that you would do this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you and I thank you so much. And if it's at all possible, I pray you will join us for Easter Sunday. We have a sunrise service, weather permitting, outdoors at 7 a.m., we have breakfast for everybody at 8. We have life groups at 9, as usual. Worship at 10, as usual. But our choir's got some beautiful music for us, and we have some wonderful things coming up. That's next Easter, next Sunday for Easter. And again, as I shared with you, even if you can't be with us uh, physically, please watch the service today and watch the uh, Palm Sunday service tonight. Obviously, I'm saying tonight, I'm obviously at home. It's Friday and uh, as I'm doing this, but I try to remember that I'm, you're watching this on Sunday, and I'm just so grateful that you do. It makes me so happy when I look on there and I see that people have actually logged on to watch because it tells me that you just want to study and learn with me, and it makes me so very happy. God bless you.